we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which our church stands. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Laura, and I'd like to welcome you to Thrive Worship. It's going to be a great service today as we complete our series on the Wesleyan Movements of Grace. Provenient, justifying, and this morning, Reverend Shannon will be talking to us about sanctifying grace. We have great music, Darcy and Christina, Kevin and my dad, I mean, he's okay, but he's no Darcy. With our benediction song coming from the churches of New Zealand, put together by Grant Norsworthy, whom some of you know and have met before. Next week, we'll be gathering outside at the Annex at 10 a.m. Our service will stream live on our Facebook page. We can fit hundreds and hundreds of people, and we're not expecting so many, so we will easily follow the current coronavirus set rules set forth by the Illinois governor. Bring a lawn chair or a picnic rug or a, and pack a picnic lunch for yourself or your family only. Please, no sharing food. Everyone is asked to wear a mask. I know we are outside, but out of an overabundance of caution, please wear one and make sure your family members are wearing one too. We won't be using projection, so a song sheet will be provided. We will be taking an offering and a mask gloved off usher will move about our congregation with an offering plate. Also, we will be celebrating communion. Come with your hands cupped together and Reverend Mike will place the bread already dipped in the juice into your hands. Don't just come on your own. Invite all those who have been missing church these last few week months. Again, there is plenty of room to spread out and ample parking. The Twigs Annex is located on the corner of Maryville Road and Stratford Lane. Make sure you claim your spot early and please observe social distancing guidelines. We are all looking forward to seeing you. Let us pray. God, we are excited to be together in person next week together in our worship service. We pray, God, that you will bless us as we gather together. And for those of us watching online today, may you draw us closer in relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance. From my enemies Till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no Yeah. 
child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God All throughout my history Faithfulness has walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring In every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness All over my life all over my life I see your promises in fulfillment All over my life All over my life Help me remember when I'm weak Fear may come but fear will leave You lead my heart to victory You are my strength And you always will be I see the evidence of your goodness All over my life All over my life I see the promises and fulfillment my life, all over my life. I see the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. I see the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away. Because of you, oh Jesus. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life. Good morning as we go into our time of prayer this morning. I think it's appropriate that we uh, remember what it is we're celebrating this weekend. Uh, as a nation, we refer to it as Labor Day. Uh, it's a time when many, uh, that many consider uh, end of summer. And so families gather to uh, maybe for one last barbecue or one last uh, dip in the swimming pool, uh, but really, it's about remembering all of those who continue to work hard to provide for their families, uh, to remember those who work hard uh, to keep us safe, to keep us healthy, uh, to produce uh, everything that we need for the farmers who work hard, uh, for any and all who labor to make our lives better. Those are the ones that uh, we want to give thanks for, really, as we celebrate Labor Day this weekend. But I think it's also appropriate this morning that we remember uh, the leaders of our country, as there is such a great divide in our country today. 
uh, that we pray that uh, your God's will be done uh, throughout these next weeks as we approach the general election and we approach the election of the President of the United States. Uh, and to remember all of our local leaders, our state leaders, uh, the leaders within our churches. Uh, it's, if you read anything right now, churches are struggling because of the pandemic that we call COVID-19. Uh, giving is down. Uh, attendance obviously is all over the road. Uh, some are still uh, online as we are. Others are doing a mix of outside, inside, and online. Others are, it's, it's just a whole mixed bag. And so uh, giving and attendance, uh, worship is hard right now. So let us pray for churches. Let us pray for the leaders, the pastors, uh, each one of us as believers in Jesus Christ. Let's remember to keep all of us in prayer. Uh, also continue to pray for all of those who are hurting, uh, those who have had surgery this past week, uh, those who are undergoing chemo or radiation or some so form of uh, cancer treatment, Lord, especially for those families who have lost loved ones over this past week. Uh, so as we go to God in prayer, let's remember those that we know about, each one of us individually. Let's lift each of those people, each of those situations up to God this morning. So let us pray together. Oh God, again we come and we give you thanks. And Lord, especially on this Labor Day weekend, we are reminded of those who labor to provide for each and every one of us. And Lord, we do remember uh, the church as a whole and the leaders of those churches. Lord, it's a hard time. It, no one knows what is best. It's the first time that we've ever had to go through this as a church. And so Lord, just be with us. Continue to call us out. Continue to guide and direct us. And guide and direct our path as Thrive Church. Lord, continue to uh, grant us your wisdom and your knowledge. Allow us to make the best decisions that we can based on what we know and what we understand. And Lord, continue to uh, watch over the children. Lord, as they have gone back to school, and again, Lord, it's such a uh, mixed bag whether they're in attendance or whether they're doing remote learning, Lord, there's not a good answer. And again, the division is, is deep on what's best. You know, Is it real? Is it necessary? Uh, we pray for those parents especially that have to work and are, still have to do figure out remote learning. Um, we pray for those parents who never thought they would be uh, homeschooling their kids. And Lord, the, <laughs> that's where they're at. So. Lord, give them an extra dose of patience uh, and again, give them an extra dose of love. And may this time of teaching their children, may it be really a time of bonding with their children. And Lord, we do pray for the teachers and the leaders of the school district. Lord, again, they are having uh, unprecedented times to guide and direct. And Lord, we pray for each of us as individuals. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would continue to, again, call us out to give us a new way to reach out to others in the midst of COVID-19, to not allow us to be content to just be uh, complacent and to think that there's no work to be done since we have to uh, social distance. Lord, give us a new vision, a new way, a new thought about how we can continue to reach out and to connect people to your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, let each of us pause for just a moment and again lift up all of those that we know about, 
those lo the loved ones, the lives, the stories, the situations that only we know about. And so Lord, hear our prayers. Oh God, thank you for always being there to hear our prayers, to meet us where we are, to grant us your sense of compassion and your sense of care and love. And Lord, continue to forgive us for all the ways that uh, we sin against you and all of the mistakes that we make and the people's lives and hearts that we hurt. Lord, grant us your Lord to love others. Grant us your peace. And Lord, be with us now as we pray the prayer that your son Jesus taught his disciples and he continues to teach each one of us to pray saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
is Pastor Mike with a word on today's offering. Before I talk to you about giving, I want to draw your attention to the three ways that you can give. Our address in the top left hand corner of your screen, 2101 Cleveland Boulevard, Granite City, Illinois, is the place you can send a check. The number in the top right hand corner of your screen is our text to give number. You can simply text the amount of your offering to 84321. Make sure you search for Thrive Church in order to make sure your money is going to the right place. You can do that by searching with our postcode 62040. Then along the bottom is our online giving portal. It's a safe way you can give to Thrive, knowing your money is safe and will get to us as soon as possible. Building the Kingdom of God just doesn't demand our time or our many talents, but also requires us to give. And by give, I mean financially. Like many churches, as our physical doors have remained closed due to COVID-19 on Sunday mornings, our offerings have gone down, way down. Now this is not a lecture and neither is it a commandment from up on high that unless you give money, you'll get hit by a lightning bolt. It's just a gentle reminder that the life of the church continues, as does the building of the kingdom of God. God has given Thrive everything we need to weather this particular COVID-19 storm. But God funds the kingdom a little differently to, say, a venture capitalist. Instead of writing a check payable to First Ethereal and Enlightened Perpetual Paradise and Bliss Bank, God writes that check to each of us, payable to our own bank account. I have a theory. I believe that God gives everything, and I mean everything, a gathering like ours needs, in order to build this corner of the kingdom of God. God's will be done, remember, on earth as it is in heaven. They're the words that we pray, but do we match our giving to those words? Whether we meet online, outside, like next week at the Annex on the corner of Stratford Lane and Maryville Road, under the shade of those beautiful trees on the grass, or whether we meet within the four walls of a physical church building that we've been entrusted with, God calls us still to invest ourselves and the finances he has blessed us with in order for us to participate in the building of the kingdom of God on earth through thrive as it is in heaven. Let us pray. God, open our hearts, open our arms, open our doors and open our lives to your presence and the building of your kingdom. Help us to give with generous hearts, over and over abundantly, just as you have blessed us in so many more ways that we can count. As we continue God in this little corner of the planet, we pray that these gifts we receive will have a local impact, like paying our water bills so the plants in our community garden can continue to grow, through to our high-speed internet connection, Lord, so that we can have a global impact too here online, open to people around the world with the good news of your grace and favour. We pray a rich shower of blessing, God, to rain down upon those that are planted here in Granite City, doing the worshipful work of the Kingdom of God, that we may continue to grow as the people called thrive. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm Darcy, and this is our scripture reading for today. It comes from the New Testament, the book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to give lives self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. May God add God's blessing to the reading, hearing and doing of God's word.
Good morning, friends. The past two Sundays, you've heard Pastor Lisa and Pastor Mike tell you the stories of their calls to ministry. I'm going to tell you mine this morning. It is a very long and winding story, but I'm going to keep it short and sweet. I was 12 years old when I first heard God calling me to vocational ministry, specifically to be a missionary. When I went off to college several years later, that was still my plan. But then my freshman year of college, I met and started dating the wrongest boy possible, and things went sideways spiritually. By the time that I came back to the Lord, uh, I was married to the absolute rightest boy, um, my husband of going on 33 years. Um, but he was not called to be a missionary. So I went with what felt like at that point kind of plan, God's plan B. So I poured myself into being a very active lay person in our local church. Every job that you could try, I tried. Uh, and some of them I was pretty good at, youth ministry and teaching adult Sunday school. And some of them I was not good at, van ministry, church treasurer, uh, but I tried them all. Um, in midlife, I was still feeling drawn to vocational ministry, but it seemed impossible to me. One night, my husband and I were attending an ordination service uh, for a friend of ours, uh, and my husband leaned over to me and whispered, you know you should be up there. So he believed in my call, even when I was wavering. I just couldn't figure out how, as a stay-at-home mother of five children, middle-aged, it was possible for God to still use me in vocational ministry. But then we had a pastor come who believed in my call, and his encouragement was enough, enough for me to enroll in online classes and start working toward ordination. And some of you have heard the rest of that story, how ultimately I left my denomination just short of ordination over some irreconcilable differences and found my way to thrive where I was able to be ordained this past January. So I was first called to ministry at the age of 12. I was ordained at almost 55, which uh, among the three of us who are ordained at Thrive. I've certainly got the record for uh, taking the longest from, you know, 
the starting point to the finishing line. But I do believe that every step forward, every step back, every digression, every uh, setback, all of it was ultimately used by God to teach me, refine me, mature me, and prepare me for a life of service. Because that's the way the work of God usually goes in our lives. Long and winding, like my story. Unfortunately, we often think that it should be simple. We often expect it to be simple. Step A, step B, step C, and then straight on to glory. But that is not how grace works. When I was a little girl, I used to pretend to be a superhero. Now, this was before the Marvel the MCU kind of took over the movie theaters and before there were superheroes everywhere. So we had Superman movies and uh, The Incredible Hulk was on TV and Saturday mornings you could watch the Shazam and Isis Power Hour. But I didn't, re I didn't read comics so I really wasn't exposed to a lot of superheroes so maybe that explains why my superhero had such a kind of lame origin story or backstory. Now her name was Jillian, I do remember this, and she was a scientist, and she was a completely ordinary person until she took her superpower pills. Yes, that is right. My superhero, the source of her powers, the only thing that allowed her to fly, to operate, you know, to use super strength, to read minds, uh, was a drug. Now this is not unlike the 2011 movie Limitless starring Bradley Cooper, but I came up with this idea first in the early 70s. Again, with her pills, Jillian was amazing, without them completely ordinary. Now. Church-wise, I come out of the Wesleyan holiness tradition. My father was a free Methodist pastor. I spent most of my adult life in the Church of the Nazarene. I still love those denominations. I love, love, love many things about Wesleyan holiness theology. For the past two weeks, we've been talking about the, the, the movements of God's grace, the work of God's grace in our lives, the ways in which it manifests. Pastor Lisa talked to you about prevenient grace the grace that goes before us, convicting, wooing, calling us before we even understand that we need it. And Mike talked to you about saving grace, justifying grace, the grace that sets us in right relationship with the God who created us. But also, we believe in sanctifying grace. And as Wesleyan people, in fact, we believe in entire sanctification, the idea that our hearts can be cleansed, that we can have perfect love, freedom from inbred sin. And in Wesleyan Holiness Churches, we put a lot of emphasis on this, this doctrine. It was kind of our distinctive. And, but I must say, for most of my life, it was very confusing for me. The way that I heard it preached sounded like a church version of Jillian's superpower pills. Go to the altar, pray a prayer of total consecration, surrender yourself to God, and in a crisis moment, God will cleanse your heart completely and you will have the spiritual superpower pill. And I kept looking for people whose lives seemed to match what I thought was being preached. If they had nothing left but perfect love, it should be pretty obvious, right? I could never find anyone who seemed to live up to my expectations, and it truly wasn't because I was trying to be judgmental or set this impossibly high bar. It was because I had received this idea that sanctification was kind of a one and done deal. It was perfection in a moment. Step A, ask Jesus into your heart. Step B, surrender yourself to the Spirit and be sanctified. Take that spiritual superpower pill. Step C, straight on to glory. But that is not really the picture that we find of sanctification in the scriptures. 
And again, sanctification is just the purifying of our hearts and lives. But because people, myself included, have so often been confused by this doctrine, a lot of us, even preachers, have shied away from talking much about it. But this work of grace, the work of the Spirit in purifying us, maturing us, growing us in the likeness of Jesus is so important. And when we neglect it, it bears rotten fruit. In 2005, there were two sociologists who wrote a book called Soul Searching, and it was really a sociolo sociological examination of the spiritual lives of teenagers in America at the time. But the observations that these uh, researchers made applied to a lot more than teenagers. And they gave us a term that has been used widely since then for the religion that they found these kids practicing. Church kids, Christian kids, but a set of beliefs that they were adhering to. They call, and the, the sociologists called this moralistic therapeutic deism. And I wanna read you uh, the list of common beliefs that makes up moralistic therapeutic, therapeutic deism. Number one. A God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. Number two, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. Number three, the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Number four, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. And number five, good people go to heaven when they die. I think of this as kind of the gospel of making nice people nicer. Uh, it's weak sauce, right? It's self-interested. It's uh, shallow sounding. It sounds completely inadequate for the world that we live in, and it also depends on people being naturally good and enlightened and not needing God's help to be transformed. Moralistic therapeutic deism doesn't take sin seriously. It doesn't take the inbred sin that sanctification deals with seriously. Now, of course, there's another stream of theology that takes sin very seriously. Um, and these are the, the folks who talk about uh, I sin every day in thought, word, and deed. I am a filthy sinner, and I will never be anything but a filthy sinner, but thanks be to God, the blood of Jesus covers my sins. Our Wesleyan theology of sanctification, we navigate between these two extremes. We do take sin seriously, but we take grace more seriously still. We believe not only in the possibility, but the necessity of moral progress for the Christian, of growth in holy love, but it is always, always, always dependent on the grace of God. Now I want to read again the passage from Titus that we heard this morning. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Now, Titus is one of what is called the pastoral epistles. This is Paul giving instruction in Timothy and Titus to his kind of official representatives to uh, churches in outlying areas. In this case, the church on the island of Crete. And this was, by the way, a place with a reputation for deception and greed and immorality. The passage that precedes the one we read includes a lot of very specific and time-bound moral instructions. If we were to go back and read the several verses before this in the book of Titus, 
you would hear very specific instructions on how wives should behave and slaves should behave and masters should behave and you know this is how you function in society but a holy sanctified life in 2020 in the United States is going to look very different from a holy sanctified life on the island of Crete in the first century. We live in a different economic structure, we live in a different social structure, um, and a lot of the moral instructions are historically contextualized. But here in the verses that we've read, verses 11 through 14, Paul gives answers to bigger and more universal questions. How do we live holy lives? And why do we live holy lives? These neighborhood dogs are going to drive me crazy. They're trying my holiness right now. The answer to both questions, how do we live holy lives and why do we live holy lives, is the same. The answer that Paul gives here, it's the same. It's the grace of God. The foundation for holy living is the grace of God and the source of holiness is the grace of God. Our motivation for the way that we live as followers of Jesus is rooted entirely in the gracious of God, graciousness of God. Paul reminds us of one thing that we've already heard from Pastor Mike about this grace. It is a saving grace. So he begins by saying that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The gospel is not about making nice people nicer. It's about making dead people live, setting captives free, moving from darkness to light. This is grace that brings salvation. As Paul writes to Titus in the next chapter of his letter, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. So reminding us of what Mike talked about last week. The grace of God is a saving grace, but it is also a sanctifying and transforming grace. The grace of God doesn't just save us and then leave us where we were. It changes us. It teaches us how to live. It helps us to exchange one mode of living for another. Elsewhere in his writings, Paul often uses the illustration of taking off and putting on, um, like changing clothes. We take off the old ungodliness and sinful passions and we put on the virtues of Christ in their place. But in this passage, Titus has a unique and wonderful way of expressing this process. He says, it, the grace of God, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. So you hear this, the, the negative command, it teaches us to say no, but also a positive side. First, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And I want to just kind of draw out one thing. It's the grace of God that teaches us. It is not my job or Mike's job, or Lisa's job, to teach you to say no to worldliness or ungodliness. It's the grace of God that will teach you. Now this is a huge blessing to you, I know, and it's a huge blessing to me, because I am your sister, I am your fellow, fellow pilgrim, I want to help you along the road, I want you to help me, but I'm so glad that I don't have to be the Holy Spirit. I can entrust your training to the grace of God, and you can trust me to the grace of God. And I think many Christians are very afraid of this idea. We think, how will people follow the rules if we don't tell them all the rules? And how, how will they know the bad things that they should stop doing if we don't tell them the bad things that they need to stop doing? And I am not making light of the role of the church 
with the role of the scriptures in moral instruction. We should be learning together in community, apprenticed to Jesus. But ultimately, the grace of God is more powerful than we often give it credit for. And I think if we weren't worried about boasting, if we weren't worried about looking proud, many of us would be able to say, here are the places where God has taught me to say no to ungodliness, to worldliness. He's helped me to say no to being critical or negative or unforgiving. Or he's helped me to say no to outbursts of anger or to using other people for my own gratification or to insisting on my own way. Ask yourself right now, what has God helped you to say no to from your past? But then after we've learned to say no to those things, there is a turn, there is an embracing of a new life. The grace of God is helping me to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly life now, to use Paul's language. Now, not someday, not pie in the sky when you die, it's happening now, in this present age. Now, those characteristics may not sound very exciting to us, self-controlled, and upright, and godly, but what is more radical than moderation, self-control, integrity in a culture like the one of Crete or ours that is enslaved to greed, self-indulgence, and corruption. Through this sanctifying grace, we find ourselves able to testify again, I've broken the habit I never thought I could break. I've forgiven the person I never thought I could forgive. I've, I've manifested patience or courage or love that I know is a gift of grace because it's so unlike my natural character, so unlike the old me. And friends, that's what sanctification looks like. What's more, this grace, it's active, past, present, and future. In fact, when I first started to really study this passage, its emphasis on time is one of the things that most stood out to me. And maybe that's because we're obsessed with time with its passage, with the weight of the past, with our fears for the future, with our desperate attempts to mend what's already happened or control what's coming. And then we've got this year where our sense of time is all out of whack. We feel sometimes like we're living in sort of suspended animation. But we need to hear, even in this current madness, we need to hear that the grace of God has been all over time. Look for the fingerprints of God's graciousness and you'll find them. Past, present, future. What does this passage tell us that the grace of God has already done in the past? The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared. Jesus Christ gave, already gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness. And what will the grace of God do in the future? It will bring our blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Christian gospel deliberately orients itself by looking backward and forward, determined to live in the light of what has been done for us and in light of the hope that is before us. And it is that which enables us to live in this present age as Paul describes us, being taught by grace, living self-controlled, upright, and godly lives, a redeemed people, a people who are his very own, eager to do good. What sets us free from the weight of the past, what delivers us from fear of the future, what transforms our present, it's these historic appearance, appearings bringing the grace of God to us. You know, this passage uses the, the word appearing more than once. In Greek, the word is epiphania. It's where we get the word epiphany. We usually use this passage of scripture around epiphany. When we remember the three kings coming, we call it the Feast of Lights. Because epiphania literally means shining forth. And it's a, a reminder to us of all the scriptural promises that have been fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ. Promises like the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. 
on those living in the shadow of death, a light has dawned. The Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. And all of that, all of those promises fulfilled, remind us of another, maybe the most fundamental thing that I want you to hear this morning about this grace, this saving grace, this grace that went before us, this all-embracing, sanctifying, transforming, ever-active grace. This grace is a person. In saying that the grace of God has appeared, has shown forth, Paul is pointing our attention to the incarnation of Jesus. Jesus Christ is the epitome and the embodiment of the grace of God. He is grace personified, and so his first appearing, his birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, is the visible appearance of grace in the world. It's the epiphany of God's goodness toward us. Listen to a similar passage from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The gospel is never about abstract principles. It's never about doctrinal statements, even though we hold doctrinal statements. It is always, always, always rooted in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. He is the one who saves. He is the one who transforms, who redeems our pasts and secures our future. He is our great God and Savior, and he will appear again at the end of history. So, you don't need a spiritual superpower pill. You don't need an ecstatic experience. You don't need some crisis moment that fits someone else's description of entire sanctification. You have what you need. You have the Holy Spirit that has come through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to live within you, to transform you, to make you into a person filled with resurrection power. The grace of God coming to you in Jesus Christ is enough. Grace is enough to save you, to transform you, to bring you into the fellowship of the people of God. Grace is enough to free you from the weight of the past, Grace is enough to give you hope for the future, to keep you until Jesus comes again. And I don't care how inadequate you feel. I don't care how much of a failure you feel like this morning. I don't care how far you've fallen short of the person that you hoped to be. Trying harder is not the solution. Paul gave moral instructions to Titus but then he followed them with this beautiful expression of the gospel because those moral instructions can only be filled or fulfilled through the grace of God at work in us. The grace of God manifested in Jesus is not only our motive for holy living, it is the only means by which holiness is possible. A living relationship with Jesus Christ the grace of God in you will prove to be more than enough. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen.
his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. Children, and the 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 children, and
he honore, he gloria, he hallelujah ki te atua, he maumarongo, he atapai, he manaki ki runga i te matau te whetua, he hakaaro pai, he hakaaro mui, he hakaaro roa ki ngā tangata katoa, nō reira ki a tau ki a tātou katoa, te atapai o tō tātou e riki o iu kalaiti, me te aroha o te atua, me te whiwhinga tahitanga ki te wairua tapu, āke, 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 āke.